Hello and welcome to the program. This is Money Line with Nancy and I am Nancy uh, Naji. Today we will be uh, looking at, uh, <laughs> what, what can I say? The last uh, three days have been very eventful. Uh, really from the May 29th inauguration of President Bola Ahmed at Tinubu with a pronouncement of fuel subsidy is gone with a lot of things he said. Monetary policy needs thorough uh, house uh, cleaning. Uh, the interest rate in Nigeria is anti-business and anti-people. Uh, to uh, that same day when he talked about fuel subsidy being gone, you started seeing fuel queues uh, across cities in uh, Nigeria. To a meeting uh, between the federal government and uh, labor organizations. It ended in a deadlock just even before uh, the meeting started. Uh, we saw a price template, a new price template from the NNRPC indicating the different price ranges uh, for uh, states in Nigeria. And immediately that came out, the few queues somewhat disappeared. In Abuja uh, yesterday uh, night, there was no queue where I had to buy fuel, and um, my fuel tank was just a little bit below a uh, half tank, and it takes me about 22, 25,000 naira to fill it up when it is in half tank as it were. But yesterday evening, I filled my tank with 57,000 naira, the same, uh, um, uh, you know, the same, almost the same because it was almost a little bit below water tank and in fact I was looking at the fuel pump I was like wouldn't it end would it, it end and where I did buy fuel uh, the, it was written there boldly 537 naira uh, per liter but you would see that the fuel queues have disappeared have Nigerians now resigned uh, to faith that okay there is no subsidy as it were now um, though according to the law there is still a budgetary provision for fuel subsidy from at least now till the end of June. Today is June 1. So there are a lot of issues. Meanwhile, federal, uh, labor organizations rose from the meeting uh, yesterday with the federal government as well as the NNPC Limited and the Central Bank of Nigeria and did say that the meeting, uh, that it was an ambush, as it were, that how can you have decided and you're calling us again for a meeting, uh, but uh, the deliberations, they say, will still uh, continue uh, uh, later. Labor would also be meeting tomorrow, I'm aware of that. So a lot of things have happened really in the last uh, three uh, days. We will be looking at even balancing the political, the social economic fallout of uh, President uh, Tinubu's uh, pronouncement and perhaps the posture of uh, the federal government so far concerning reforms as, as regards to fuel subsidy as well as what more can we expect uh, from our President Tunubu moving forward. My guest will be joining me uh, shortly, but don't forget to join us on all our social media platforms. You can connect with us as the handles are on the screen uh, right now. In case you want to email us, that is the email address on the screen. Don't also forget to subscribe to our YouTube our channel Moneyline with Nancy TV, where you also get to watch uh, the uh, show. Dr. Igwe, are you back on right now? Yes, I am. Okay. Nancy. So, sorry about that disruption. Okay, let's, let's quickly move ahead. Uh, uh, during my intro, I did speak about at least the last three days have been so eventful. Few cues have come, and in Abuja, at least where I've been since yesterday, disappeared i don't know for lagos and i don't know for ph where uh, you are perhaps you should just give me an update of what's happening in portacos really then we'll take it from there oh oh dr Igwe is frozen again what's happening i hope it's not raining in portacos <laughs> dr Igwe, can you hear me now yes i can hear you okay i so said give me an update Internet. of what Yes, the internet, the internet is, is pretty unstable, yes. Exactly. Go okay. ahead. So I just asked, can you give me an update of what's happening in Port Harcourt? Are the few queues still there? Well, here and there, there are a few uh, queues that are disappearing slowly. But uh, there's a lot of outrage uh, with the sudden increase in prices. But like you alluded, um, the president in his inaugural speech 
promised the country that uh, it will be compassionate and he will uh, govern but not rule. He also said he will consult and dialogue but not dictate. Um, after what many consider as a keenly contested or that said controversial elections, I think it's imperative for the president to keep to his word, especially in his inaugural speech, that he will consult and that he will govern and not rule. This uh, fuel subsidy removal is a really is an acid test to how things will proceed. And I did say to many people that um, after this kind of election, I think it is important for the president to cultivate trust. He needs to rebuild trust. Um, this really reminds me of uh, those days that the National Youth Service Corps was introduced after the Civil War. Uh, I don't know whether you were born that time, my dear. But one of the reasons was that uh, the country became highly divided. And after these uh, recent elections, very many people are disenchanted, very many people are disillusioned. But then, uh, President Tinubu has to be the president of all, those who voted for him and those who did not vote for him as he promised. So I think it is important he consults and he dialogues, especially regardless of how well intended uh, this fuel removal, uh, fuel subsidy removal, uh, you know, has been or can be. So building trust is very important, building confidence among the people and making sure that everybody is carried along. Do you think that President Tinubu started on a good footing, bearing in mind what you just said, that um, he promised Nigerians that he will govern and not rule, that fuel subsidy is gone, that the funds should be channeled into uh, health, education, public infrastructure, and also creating uh, of jobs? Do you think that that is a good footing on which he started? And do you think that Nigerians are also understanding that part, that for him to govern and not rule, for him to be able to do some of those things, that hard decisions need to be taken, and we need to cooperate with him? So do you think that Nigerians understand that? That's two questions in one. Yes, I think that um, Nigerians, uh, many Nigerians, especially from the background that, you know, the campaigns and the elections, you know, there were a lot of fragmentations. Many Nigerians may not understand him uh, at this point. So there's a need to, for a lot of education and enlightenment. He needs to tell us why he needs to do this at this time, especially where the money will be channeled to. What is the plan for the money? 400 billion naira will be saved every month from uh, the first subsidy removal. Where will he plot the money? That is very critical because we don't want to move away. I mean, you remember that the first subsidy regime was bedeviled with all kinds of accusations of corruption. So we, want, we don't want to leave prime pan to fire. It is important for the president to articulate what he wants to do with the first subsidy savings. I mean, savings from the first subsidy. 400 billion is a lot of money. Another thing that is important is that the president and his team would have preempted that such removal will, you know, lead to, of course, the regulation, which means that the market will dictate the price. Although there are people who think that, how can NMPC be fixing the price when we are talking about the regulation? Complete deregulation means let the market fix the price. So NMPC Limited has no business fixing the price. But that is another discussion. Now that we are seeing 530, what it means is that there will be hyperinflation and there will be implications on the poorest of the poor. And whenever every, anything affects prices, affects food, people who are already agitated, people who are already frustrated, get very frustrated and even become violent. So I think it's important that the president and his team to have preempted such uh, scenarios and would have at least prepared for it. Everybody you go to now that are complaining, and regardless of the good intentions, you know, on the savings and the promises of quantum infrastructure, education and everything, people need to know that there needs to be food on their table. And the hyperinflation, there must be remedial action, um, you know, for this implication because ordinary people are going to be impacted negatively, at least in the short term. So he needs to prepare us 
that difficult times are going to be ahead. And he, he needs to tell us convincingly what will happen at the end of the tunnel. That will help us endure. That will help us, as you said, as very resilient people become resilient because we know that there's renewed hope on the way. But unless and until this is articulated, this whole knee-jerk reaction will affect every one of us and will deepen you know, the uh, deficit in trust that had existed from the keenly contested other state, controversial other state, contest, you know, uh, contentious elections that have been won and lost uh, in the past few months. Dr. Igwe, do you think with the, with the events of, with what we've seen in the last three days, that this government uh, was adequately prepared, at least since the election result announcement in March, uh, since he was uh, declared, uh, uh, when he was declared the winner, I think March 1, 2023 by INEC, from that time till May 29, he of course knew that he even in his manifesto said he would take us subsidies. Even all the, at least the major presidential candidates did mention that. But from the events of the last three days, do you think that he ha has, pre he prepared for the event of the last three days, the way it has played out, really? Well, <laughs> did, you, so, did you think that so that was the action they wanted to take first, to take Nigeria well, to pr surprise? NNPC also well, fixing a price in a supposedly deregulated market where there's a PIA, Yes, well, well, I think that it's very clear that so far it does not appear to us that uh, uh, adequate preparation and adequate planning took place, which is very surprising because at the end of the day, we read a long time ago that even in the budget, there was no, you know, I mean, you know, people felt that maybe it would uh, come as a supplementary budget, but at least on paper, we did not see any provisions for SWIFT subsidies. So, there were those conversations, in my view, that this will happen. But it should have been accompanied with some education, with some framing, so that people get prepared. I mean, right now, there are people who cannot live from, I mean, who cannot go to work because of transport fares. There are people who cannot afford what to eat. I think that um, the president would and his team would have preempted and prepared some of these scenarios. And also, they would have started some engagement with the labor union. I mean, the responses and the reaction of labor union is not, they, it's just natural. It's just simple that they are not going to agree. And I mean, we are in Nigeria. In the past, when some of these very, you know, well-intended decisions have been taken, they have been back and forth. So I think the president, I mean, there's no indication so far, I don't know what will happen tomorrow, but there's no indication so far that adequate preparation was made. And Many Nigerians have been taken by surprise. I mean, look at you. What if you could not afford the money to buy fuel? Maybe you wouldn't be able to be on the show this morning. And this, I am certain there are many people who this decision and hiking price took by surprise and is going to really alter the whole ecosystem and will have very, very dire implications. So, um, so far, I don't think that preparation has happened. That's the pressure many Nigerians get and many analysts get. But who knows, in the next few days, maybe there will be something that uh, the president and his team will do roll out. We are waiting. D Dr. Igwe, do you think that uh, the political and the social side of this uh, few, uh, petrol subsidy removal has been what has been hampering uh, the decision to be taken firmly from any uh, government? Because if you take a look at it successively, uh, from even the military uh, regimes did also raise fuel price at a point to Obasanjo. I think Obasanjo raised it perhaps three or four times, if I'm not I'm mistaken, all through until uh, even the last uh, pres president that said, that's President Buhari that said he would take it off, but there was no political will as it were. Do you think it's the political side, the political and the social angle that has been hampering this economic side, which everyone says is a necessity? For us to survive as a country and for us to pull those resources and do other meaningful things but the social political side has been taking us back how do we balance okay. it how, how how do we balance it for a tinubu now that is president that is known as a political strategist do you think that he will get the job done this administration communicate to nigerians in an effective way and we may not feel it as it were well, Nancy, there is no there is no good time to remove uh, first subsidies. 
um, you allow prices to climb from 190 to 500. Yes, there have been a whole lot of postponement. Um, you know, no political leader would like to see the population, you know, complain as it were uh, at any point. So many, many leaders in the past have contemplated this and because of the political implications, um, I would say they have chickened out. So this is a courageous move um, by the president. But again, uh, we must also realize, like you said, it is important to communicate it. Well, subsidy corruption is something we all know. And it is important that the president to and his team to justify why this is necessary at this time. The country, I mean, as you were trying to give us the news, you highlighted that there are revenue shortfalls. We cannot continue. I mean, um, the numbers we saw uh, between 2016 and 2023, um, the former administration spent more than 17 trillion on fuel subsidy. Um, that amount of money will do quite a lot. What I expected was that the president and his team will roll out a well-articulated plan of where these monies will be plowed into. And with that, you engage labor unions and you engage the people and ask the people to say, monitor me with, between my promises and my actions, especially you know, this is an opportunity for the president to rebuild trust. And I, I, I cannot emphasize this enough because I believe that um, building trust and building social capital, if you look at countries like Sweden, Denmark, Norway, I mean, the countries that come, the first six countries on the Corruption Perception Index every year are countries with very high public trust and social capital. So if the president succeeds to seize this moment, to rebuild social capital. That means that he will indirectly be fighting corruption. There's been a whole lot of efforts and resources that countries like Nigeria expend in fighting corruption. Nobody has realized or recommended or suggested that building social capital, building public trust is one of the most effective but indirect ways of fighting corruption. So the whole policy of first subsidy removal is an important opportunity for the president to communicate effectively to an already frustrated, fragmented, and disenchanted public and citizen to regain their trust about his objectives, about his intention, and strengthen his legitimacy among those who supported him and those who did not support him so that we can chart a common course and um, you know, follow him, match his words with actions, and see the results of how these monies will work for the people. Because for a subsidy, has been working for the elites, the corrupt few. Now, the first of the removal must and will and should work for the people. And it is the box stops on the president's table to articulate that and give us that plan and use that to galvanize the trust that has been eroded in the past few months during the campaigns. Okay, you, you, you've raised a few points and let me take it from there, from uh, the last point which you said that the fuel subsidy has really been for the elites. Uh, it's, uh, you know, corruption riddled. I guess that is what you're trying uh, to say, that Absolutely. some people have, have been fat from the proceeds of fuel subsidy. Now, the question of transparency and accountability, no, the question of accountability comes in there. Have we now been able to ascertain how that fuel subsidy is being done and the racket and those that are siphoning the subsidy uh, funds. What should happen to those people if they are found culpable? That is one. So that it's not as if, okay, telling Nigerians that we need to take off subsidy, it needs to go. But the racketeering in there, we've not sorted it out. Just a few days ago, the House uh, lawmakers did say that they cannot ascertain how many liters of fuel that we consume. But there is a subsidy. There's an agency or agencies even in the value chain that are supposed to give us that information. What data are they banking on? For example, the NNPC, GC, NNPC Limited GCEO said a few days ago that the federal government is owing NNPC 2.8 trillion naira. Why would they say that if the lawmakers cannot ascertain how many liters of fuel that we consume? Are we all right? <laughs> do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Nancy, 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 I get you. Um, uh, like I said, this is an important opportunity for the president and his team. One of the things, um, you know, some analysts will expect is that as soon as he, I mean, and it's not too late, as soon as he announced the removal of a uh, first subsidy, he will probably inaugurate a committee. I mean, somebody will say how many committees to look into, to audit the first subsidy regime in the past four years or eight years and make recommendations. And if there are people who, for instance, collected monies for these subsidies and did not supply the fuel, as probably may be the case, what will happen to them? And like I told you, Nancy, this is an opportunity for him. I mean, he has said the right things in his speech, but it is important for him to match his words with action. The probing or pro possible probing of beneficiaries of corrupt monies through the first, first subsidy regime is an opportunity for the president to make a point that there is a departure from the past and the time for business as usual is over. And it will send an important signal to the people, especially those you know, who are having second thoughts about how the election went and everything. It is important to bring them together you know, under a single umbrella with very patriotic and very firm decision making. So again, their box stops on the table of the president. And who knows, um, in the next few days, you know, we may hear that um, some of these things we are suggesting, uh, the president and his team already have them in mind, who knows, um, they could um, go in that direction. But it is important, like you said, that those who benefited from first subs in the past, yes, we know it has ended, but those who benefited from it in the past, who collected public resources, should not be allowed to go scot-free, so that, you know, this government will demonstrate clearly that, uh, you know, that is a departure from the past. And that will help to contribute to the message of a new hope and all the good things the president said um, in his speech. Now, the president has been communicating a message of renewed hope together in hope. And let's not be hopeless that as far as the S exists, that Nigeria would also exist. Messaging is very important. Communication is very important. How, as much as we know that communication is important, it's not also easy. It wouldn't also be easy for a very touchy and a sticky issue such as fuel subsidy removal or petrol subsidy removal. How do you think that this administration should communicate that in a way that Nigerians would understand? Because the elites so far may understand that, but the rural people may not understand the point that the president is, that the point the president said fuel subsidy is gone, for example. How should that message be communicated to everyone well, to understand? Well Nancy, well, Nancy, I think that uh, I would say we have almost we've lost part of the opportunities uh, that are valuable. But I think that right now, it, we have to think about communicating this message practically. As you know, uh, federal government had obtained, we understand, 800 million U.S. dollars for the palliatives, um, you know, and these were all preparatory for a time like this when there will be hyperinflation. I think one way to communicate this, if you ask me, especially to touch the poorest of the poor, is to unveil the strategy to make sure that uh, the palliatives will be, uh, will reach everyone, you know, there will be inclusiveness in making sure that those who are hardest hit by the implications of this first subsidy, those poorest of the poor that we are talking about are impacted by uh, palliatives. And, you know, the stories we hear about palliatives in the past, I'm sure you recall um, that, uh, uh, you know, some of them, uh, you know, were distributed in a less inclusive and sometimes partisan manner, and that that regime is over. And it is only after that practical communication that reaches, because the poor want to, they want to eat you know, that puts food on the table of the poor, it is after that that we can now begin to communicate to them about infrastructure, about education, about the long-term benefits of, uh, about the long-term benefit of uh, some of these uh, um, decisions and policies that the federal government has, has made. So first, let's reach out to them with the palliatives, 
or at least let's unveil a practical plan for the palliatives to reach them. And secondly, let's now start the messaging of how uh, you know the money saved from the removal of first subsidy can be used for uh, quantum uh, infrastructural development that will impact on every one of us in the future. And also, um, it is also important to emphasize that in all of this, security has been the most critical issue on the agenda. I think it is important that some of these messages are put together because you cannot talk about even distribution of the palliatives with all the insecurity in the country. I think right now that Nigerians want to hear about a Marshall plan on, I mean, I don't, I don't know whether that's the right word, <laughs> on security, you know, um, in the country. Insecurity in the Southeast, in the Northeast, everywhere. There are very few roads you can travel in Nigeria now without fear of insecurity. So I think that it is important that we take all the message together because, you know, the forests of the poor are here. And even if you want to disable palliatives, if there are no, no roads to travel, how will you do it? So I think it's crit critical that some of these messages are carried up because the issues are urgent. You cannot take one and not take the other. The issue of insecurity is urgent. The issue of stability, for instance, in the Niger Delta, because, you know, I, I was also, I didn't read anything about oil theft, you know, the issues of stolen oil in the Niger Delta, the issue of criminality in that area. It's another issue, for instance, the president, we are waiting for the president to announce that, look, probing needs to happen. Criminals need to be arrested because as soon as the 400,000 barrels of oil, you know, that are allegedly stolen every day, uh, that is another first subsidy that we can harvest and put the resources together and articulate them for quantum infrastructure development and a frontline fight against insecurity, be it terrorism, be it unknown government uh, all over the country so that the kind of development we're thinking about, the kind of investment we're thinking about locally and internationally can start flowing. And that revamping of the economy that the president promised can become practicable. For the, um, th this message has been on for a long time that the, uh, that the petrol subsidy benefits the rich, but how true is this? Um, just supposing well, it with the is... fact, yes, just supposing it with the fact that, oh, it's only the rich that it benefits, it's the rich that, you, uh, that utilize or use petrol. How true is it? Because we also know there's a transmission mm -hmm. effect to a larger uh, portion of the society. You mentioned earlier, of course, with this hike we've seen, fuel, uh, food prices, I wonder what inflation numbers will be in the, in the coming months with these prices. So is it really true? Is it true that that statement that people are saying that they've been saying for years and we should go, go uh, hook, line and sinker? Because I'm a bit skeptical with that because judging by what we see and what I know, the fact of it, there's a, an economic political side uh, uh, to this. Well, I want to talk about two things. Mm -hmm. First is uh, um, if you look at the list of those who have licenses to import, I mean, let's even do a bit of diagnosis of this first subsidy. What is it all about? Um, it is about the fact that because we allegedly consume 72 million liters of fuel per day and our production capacity locally is not that much, so we have to export crude oil and import fuel. And then, you know, at the end of the day, monies are allegedly paid to some of these people who import these petroleum products to cushion the prices on the consumer. That's what this is all about. Now, how, who are the people who have licenses to do these importations? Are they ordinary people? And, you know, so that is the first thing about uh, how this first subsidy is for the rich, because they are the people who collect these monies and uh, the people who import or not import uh, this fuel. So at the end of the day, if you are talking about um, corruption and decay um, you know, in that arena, you are not going to find ordinary people there. You are going to find the elite. And that's the first thing. The second thing I want to talk about is the Gini coefficient mm -hmm. um, and the inequality you know, of, uh, of, of, you know, that, um, that's in this country. And Gini coefficient is, of course, the gap between the rich and the poor. Nigeria is not very bad. It's not as bad as South Africa, at least. 
-hmm. but is expanding. Um, the last time I checked the numbers is about 38.1, and that is the gap between the rich and the poor. And it continues. Who are the people who drive cars? They are not the ordinary people. Um, Nancy, there are people like you. Uh, the people we're talking about are the people who cannot travel except they enter Okada. Those are the people we're talking about. And who, when this happens, an average Okada rider will raise the fare. And if that does not, you know, uh, correspond with, you know, those who work, uh, you know, barely. imagine someone who earns like three to 500 Naira in a day. Those are the people we're talking about. Those are the people we say, when you talk about Nigeria as the capital of poverty, we're not talking about those importers. We're not talking about those who are able to buy fuel, whether it's 129 or, or, or 500. We're talking about those who depend on what they earn every day. And when there is an inflation, they just cannot afford to buy food. Those are the people we talk, we're talking about. And if uh, President Tinubu, uh, for any reason, decides to look into the arena of how this fuel subsidy has been paid in the last four to eight years and not been paid, the people whose names will come up, if you ask me, are the people we're talking about. And when we're talking about benefits, it is not that these subsidies are not targeted at the poor. They are targeted at the poor to cushion uh, the amount of money they pay in transport, which is an implication of how much money people spend buying fuel at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, what we have seen is these monies are allegedly diverted to private pockets. And what this means is that instead of diverting it to away from the people who they originally intended to, to benefit, let it be that the market is dictating and let there be alternative ways. And these alternative ways are crucial. That's the emphasis I want to put here. These alternative ways are developed to make sure that even though it is now dictated by the market, but those people who originally the first subsidy was targeted to impact upon are indirectly impacted upon so that um, you know they are not consumed by poverty um, um, and they can be empowered enough to still remain alive and carry out uh, whatever they are doing despite the inflation that is uh, currently mm -hmm. the case across the country. I, I wonder what will happen in the next few weeks or when we get uh, uh, the coming months, the inflation data, what that will uh, be. But from Mr. President's inaugural speech, do you, did you get an idea of what his four years presidency might look like and the necessary well, reforms that he will bring about? Well, I think that uh, he sort of, uh, even though he was very general in his speech, he sort of, he sort of um, spoke to a couple of issues, monetary policy, foreign policy, security, economy, job creation, agriculture. But the specifics we are still waiting for. I think that, um, you know, for instance, if you look at the fact that um, energy transition is here, our key source of uh, uh, revenue is oil. And, you know, with the climate change related issues, and with the issues that oil companies are now divesting, it is imperative for any country that is dependent on uh, the extractive industry, especially oil and gas like Nigeria, to begin to think creatively. I am confident that uh, the president uh, has been, I mean, you refer to him as a strategist. He has been long enough in the arena to understand these issues. And I'm sure that the people around him might have uh, articulated you know, clear plans, understanding that willy-nilly our revenue will continue to dwindle because companies are divesting either as a result of divesting from onshore to offshore where the fiscal times are different or that divesting because of climate change related issues, divesting away from fossil fuel to the renewables. Um, and indeed, NMPC Limited itself, and again, you know, if you look at the, um, the um, Petroleum Industry uh, uh, Act, you know, there's very little on renewables, but I'm happy that uh, Nigeria has an energy transition plan. So these are all these things we need to come together. And I'm certain that uh, uh, what we saw in the speech
may probably be, you know, general, you know, summaries. And I'm sure that in the coming days or weeks, some of these things may be coming out um, uh, from the president's people in detail. But the issue is, yeah, that it is urgent. Things are urgent. Poverty and the implications of this in inflation is not going to wait. People are disenchanted. People are unhappy. People, some, some are disillusioned, especially, um, you know, with the, especially those who um, see that the election didn't go exactly uh, the way uh, they felt. And it is an opportunity for the president to use every singular decision he's making, every singular policy to make sure that both those who voted for him and those who did not vote for him are carried along. Okay, Dr. Egwene, in just one minute, because we've got to go, how should a President Tinubu balance economic policy and political uh, alignment challenges, bearing in mind that we're still expecting his uh, team, the minister's announcement, and other critical uh, positions? How should he balance political alignment as well as what we need, square pegs in square holes, round pegs in round holes, the how what kind of uh, cabinet do you expect to see balance the balancing well, the balancing of it well i think that uh, we, we nigerians want a cabinet of solution providers uh, nigerians want a cabinet of uh, competence uh, and i'm certain that the president will go in that direction also nigerians want uh, the president to be inclusive so he needs to balance competence and inclusiveness. Um, as you know, um, it is uh, difficult for, I mean, it's been quite difficult for very many people, um, especially from uh, Christians, I mean, the Christian fold. Uh, the whole issue of Muslim Muslim ticket, um, you know, is still fresh in the heart of many people. So I think that uh, the president himself, as a strategist, as you referred to him earlier, will be able to make sure that there is an inclusiveness, there is competence, and there are people, he selects people uh, who work for him, who understand the, what the political and social implications of where we are coming from as a country and as a people, and who will provide solutions and support him to broaden his uh, support base and to make sure that uh, every decision he makes enjoys the trust of the people, and uh, his social capital continues to expand and not dwindle in the coming mm. days or weeks. And that way, um, you know, he will succeed as a president. All That's right. That's actually what Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Dr. Egwe, for joining us today. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and have a Thank lovely you. month. It's the 1st of June, so have a lovely month ahead. Thank you very much. I like the way you are looking. Uh, I wish you more money in your pocket to be able to <laughs> buy fuel because uh, the days ahead promise to be Oh, they are very bumpy. The days ahead yes, are, yes. will be very rough. But like they say, yes. in Nigeria, they will say it's not my portion. God will continue to provide. <laughs> and also provide know, for you it, too. <laughs> I know. <laughs> because I we are in this together. Turbulence. Yes, the pilot says nothing to worry about. Yeah. There will be turbulence, mm. but uh, nothing to worry about. Yeah. And take care. Bye bye. Yeah. Yes. I have successfully landed this plane, Moneyline with Nancy plane. <laughs> so we will uh, join. Uh, please join us again tomorrow, same time here on the station. Be the best you can be. What a change you want to see. Just before I forget, I've been speaking with Dr. Uche Igwe, who is a visiting fellow at London School of Economics and Political Science. I'll see you all tomorrow. Bye now. <laughs>